today, RBA update, is the democracy sausage still sizzling? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and property news. Joined today by Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party. Hi, Robbie. How are you going? Excellent, Martin. Just back from a week in Canberra, and uh, it's, it's a good week. And I think we're close to declaring victory on the uh, the fight to save democratic authority over the RBA. So I wanted to brief people uh, on that, and I think people should be if people have participated in this. Should be quite thrilled. It's uh, it, we're getting quite close. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Uh, I made a show last week on the uh, the Senate hearings, which were actually pretty astonishing, right? Because the only people who were actually mm. supporting the uh, the idea of uh, decoupling um, <clears throat> parliamentary control of the RBA were a few academics and those linked to the global banking cartel. Uh, everybody yes. else said this is a bad idea. Well, indeed. Now, can I? So, I'll, I want to add to your plug there uh, to the viewers of this program. Now, if you haven't seen um, what Martin did a few days ago, or at the end of last week, called it's um it's a question of democracy. I think it's called right, Martin. Yep. Um, you must watch it because that hearing has pretty much sealed the deal um, in terms of this campaign. And the the extraordinary thing is the day before. Uh, Martin, I was at a, a, a Senate hearing on bank branch closures, and I there were quite a few Liberal senators there, and I mentioned that I'd be in Parliament this week to talk about the RBA issue, and one of them said, sort of in an offhand way, he said, "Oh, oh, well, we're voting against that," and he meant we're voting they go, they're voting against repealing the 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 government's veto over the RBA, mm. and I was quite taken back because look, we've been following this closely. And we've been hammering them, right? But we hadn't had that kind of definitive feedback yet. I said, are you sure? He goes, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, so anyway, I thought, okay, well, that's what I better find out this week in Parliament. But the next day was that was the hearing that, you've, that, that you did the story on last week with those clips from the hearing. And that is um, as good an indication as you'll ever see of of the position of the of the coalition because the Liberal Party senators in that hearing getting to question real heavyweights. Now I don't, you know, I'm not fans of these people, um, <laughs> or complete fans, especially someone like Peter Costello, but they are heavyweights who spent decades working at the pinnacle of monetary policy in Australia, right? And this succession of heavyweights knocked. They didn't just disagree with the idea of getting rid of the government's veto over the RBA, they ridiculed it, mm. right? And 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 when the Liberal senators saw that, and then as Senator Dean Smith asked, you know, as you've alluded to, who who do you have, you you in the Treasury and the RBA review, who do you have um, with, with lived experience, you know, uh, compared to these gentlemen, um, who is advocating for this, and they couldn't cite anybody. And in fact, um, this is a this is a detail that most people don't know. The one person they did cite, Martin, as this expert who recommended getting rid of the RBA review, is Andrew Levin from the US Federal Reserve. And he's actually he made his recommendation in the capacity of being a, an academic at a university in the United States, but he was on the Federal Reserve board. He was actually on the board. Mm. a couple of decades the decades leading up to the 2008 meltdown of the global financial system that the federal reserve caused right this is this is the this is the guy who was a board member when greenspan alan greenspan famously did the greenspan put you know every time wall street would get into trouble he'd drop interest rates and every time they'd get into more trouble he'd drop interest rates again until finally to, in 2008 it just couldn't continue and it blew up um that guy is the only guy they could cite. Anyway, it did not impress the senators at all, the Liberal senators. And when I saw that, I thought, well, this is almost game over. And I'm happy to report from um, my meetings uh, this week in Parliament. I'm pretty sure we've got, we've, um, we're, 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 well, 
Here's the thing. I don't want to be a downer in the sense that it's always important to wait till the final vote, but I'm as confident as I've ever been prior to a final vote where this one is going to go with the caveat that because we're talking about such a momentous power struggles here, there you you know you do have to expect there there could be some rearguard action to try and save salvage this thing. What I would like to do, Martin, is give the, your viewer the sense of how this came about because once again, this is an example of the process that we are um, involved in through your channel, through our channel, etc. Working. This was a this is this is a victory, a, a, a looming victory, which is a result of the people engaging with the process, and we've been able to. Um, fight this terrible one um, back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just uh, to be clear, we're talking about the Section 11 power, which uh, uh, essentially means that the RBA is ultimately accountable to Parliament. And Parliament, yep. in very adverse situations, could intervene. They haven't used the power, but uh, the fact is the power is there. And interestingly, the people who were advocating for the removal of that power were precisely the same people who were uh, involved in the good old bail-in discussion and trying to actually be able to steal our deposits exactly. and who are very much advocates of the global banking system and the central bankers leading the way, the technocrats setting the agenda uh, without any checks and balances with regard to de democratic responsibility. So this is, this is not just an academic argument. This is a really critical discussion about yep. what the nature of democracy is and who ultimately is calling the shots. And that's why this is such a critical issue. I'm very interested, of course, because Albo was actually um, <laughs> in question time a couple of days ago, basically, and his only response was to try and ridicule ridicule the, 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 the other side because um, he had no other arguments. And it's astonishing to me that the Labour Party is the party trying to advocate for this yes, uh, removal. that's right. What I, what I would like to do is... I just want to let's do this in the rest of this show in two bits, two halves, yeah. two parts. I want to go through what we spoke to the senators about, all the members of parliament this week, as mm. myself and uh, Glenn Isherwood, my colleague, walking around the corridors, um, and then give the insights into how this victory um, uh, came about, right? Because it's important to know the details. Um, so, you know, because I'm not someone who likes to claim credit for everything. Um, this was and this was a team effort too, by the way. And when we get to that, I'd like to play that clip. Um, uh, and you, you know, you can insert it for the for the sake of the viewer. But sure. for now, look, can we go to can we go to the screen? Um, and this is so. This is what we took. There's a I got some really good advice years ago from someone who was experienced in doing the kind of work I do, but for a lot longer, he said you got to talk to politicians like they're a third grader. <laughs> <laughs> and and so one of the things that's useful is you is you go there with with some talking points to give to them that you know have the points you want to make they're there on paper and you make the points but you can leave it with them. So we were we we had produced this we were handing it around and so what you see there is we've we were basically saying and this and this is the I wanted to expand it a little bit more from section eleven but we were talking about the three parts to us the three most problematic parts of the bill and they're all but it's all the same theme, right? So. And as we say here, um, these are the, our objections to the to the bill. Why Parliament should delete parts one, two, and three, um, and why? Because they undermine the authority of Parliament. That's part one. That's the removal of the Section Eleven veto over the Reserve Bank. They undermine the authority of the Reserve Bank over the private banks, which is part two of this bill that Jim Chalmers is trying to get through. And they undermine the necessity of the financial system to serve the people and the real economy. And this is in part three of the bill. And it, like when you see them all together, you realize, man, you, you really are wanting to separate the financial system from any obligation to, to actually help people. You know, the, 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 the idea of a financial system serving the people, serving the real economy, they don't want that. And that's what you're, that's what um, we identified, you know, you were alluding to before with the question of bail in since and it's been most, you know, there's it's been a fantasy by the technocrats forever. But there's, but since two thousand and eight, the the powers that be have said, well, financial stability, system stability, has to be preserved at all costs. And 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 
we have looked in depth at this argument and it's entirely separated from the the actual the question of well hang on is this financial system that we're keeping stable is it fit for purpose is it doing what we need it to do that doesn't matter financial suit it's it, it's fit for its own purpose right it's a it's a system that serves itself forget everybody else and that is something that they they really want to enshrine in this bill so um, I'll go through it. So the big one is section just, 11. Right? Just, is- just one Sorry. thing, just one thing. Remember, of course, that they have basically removed the concept of the welfare of Australians. Yes. Right. The RBA well, had three objectives, right? We'll, we'll come on to it. But I just want to underscore that because yeah, yeah. it amazes that's me. It. That's the point. it amazes me that that has not been focused on by the media at all. The concept that the Reserve Bank is now not interested in the welfare of Australians. What? Well, um, it, it is something that should have been focused on. Now, we have reported on it, but one of the, we actually had to sort of take a tactical decision months ago to say, okay, to get a breakthrough on this question, we are going to fo- have to focus people on part one of the bill, the repeal of Section 11. And now that we're confident, though, that we're pretty close to winning on that, what we decided this week was to expand into parts two and part three, and part three is this welfare question. So we spent the week educating people on that question, right? Because, and hopefully, um, some of the media does pick up on it. So the the the, the first part is what of you and I have had have discussed um, quite a bit in the shows we've done on this question of the RBA thing, and we so our our ha- flyer here had this excellent quote from John Curtin, which defines the whole thing: "If the government of the Commonwealth." deliberately excludes itself from all participation in the making or changing of monetary policy, it cannot govern except in a secondary degree. That means someone else is in charge. He said that in 1937. That was him That was him saying it after the 1937 Banking Royal Commission had said as a, as a finding that Parliament is the ultimate authority in the financial system and the government is the executive of the Parliament. Right, so that was the, and, and they're the ones that recommended Section 11, and it was John Curtin that and went on to legislate it in 1945. Um, that's the section they're trying to get rid of because, and you're right, it's never been used in 72 years. It's never been used, but the the its existence, as Ian McFarlane, the one of the one of the um, former RBA governors, said, just because it's never been used, we're always very aware of its existence, and of course that becomes a factor. A, a part of the the tension, if you will, of the decision making process, and in an important way, he was acknowledging it was an important part of the process. Um, uh, but the 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 technocrats who wanted who recommended getting rid of it, they were trying to say, oh, you know, well, look, we think they should get rid of it, but you people are making too big a deal about it. That's what they, that, well, they didn't say it in those words, but that's no. actually what they meant. You people were making too big a deal about, it. and the people and, and and everyone else who was making a big deal about. It, so no, you're the ones who made it. I mean, they're the ones who made it the number one recommendation, right? Don't try and don't try and pretend now it's no big deal. And so then they came up with this concept of of oh well, look, yeah, now the Reserve Bank at the moment is plenty independent enough. This will future proof its independence. <laughs> And when I heard that, I saw red. Because <laughs> what does future proof mean? Future proof against what? Not against not against a lightning strike. Future proof against democracy. That's the only thing to future proof against. That sometime in the future, me as an older guy with the you know in a, in a majority of the Australian people or my kids in a, when they're adults in a majority of the Australian people may decide to vote in a government that says they're going to do something different and they get the support of the majority of the people to do that. And these people now want to do this. So they're saying now that democracy, that democratic change in the future will not have any impact over this power. This power will be put out of touch, out of reach of that democracy. I mean, you know, this, if people really thought through what, how these technocrats think, they'd be really, really shocked. Anyway, anyway, I think the, um, the good news is the Senator saw through that one.
Yeah, and look, I always thought this was a long game, and you know the agenda has always been the, for the technocrats to gain greater and greater control in the context of central bank digital yep. currencies. In, 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 and if you look at the power of those central banks over recent years, you know it has become more and more um, all embracing. And of course, it's a global connection because, of course, it's by the BIS and those sorts of things. The other observation is that, of course, the um, technocrats argued well. If you really wanted to change it le later, you could always bring a piece of legislation back into Parliament. And uh, as, as one of the senators quite rightly said, so hang on a moment, we're about to uh, want to legislate to remove a piece of legislation, and you're now suggesting that you may, later you could always bring it back. That doesn't make a lot yeah. of sense either. So, you know, whichever way you look at it, you can see that this was actually, um, you know, pretty stupid. But this long game idea, the idea of the tentacles of the central banks and uh, their hangers on um, reaching further and further, not only into the financial system, but also into democracy and ultimately being over and above democracy is the thing that I'm most concerned about. Yep. And and uh, uh, we've, we've published a, a, a pamphlet here uh we talked about in our, on the last uh discussion we had um uh called austerity the origins of austerity mm -hmm. and we trace this back a century to the people this, this this there's been this argument for a century keep governments away from the banking power yeah right the banking power has to be supreme and even more than a century i, I, I we always use this William Glad, the first po we're big advocates of a postal bank. The first public postal bank established was in England in 1861, and it was established by William Gladstone, the Prime Minister. But there was probably the Chancellor at the time, um, and he had the, he has this quote about the huge fight he had with the City of London bankers over this idea of starting a a government bank, and he said the hinge of the whole situation was this: the government itself was not to be a um, uh, a significant player of matter, matters of finance, but the money power was to remain supreme and unquestioned. This was the treasurer, the chancellor of the UK talking about how the banks thought back then, right? This 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 leopard has never changed its spots. Yep. And it's only, we only have the system we have because in countries like Australia, we had fierce um, patriots who fought really hard and were determined to make sure the financial system did serve the people. And this is their legacy, Section 11 of this Reserve Bank Act. Um, now, the other, so the other two parts we we touched on, um, uh, Martin, is uh, so part two. So I'll just I'll just go through this briefly. This is a so the, the, these the numbers of these parts I'm talking about are actually in the bill. This is in the Chalmers Bill. It's divided into parts. So all the three, all the worst parts are in the first three, right? Part two reveals section 36 of the Banking Act 1959, which empowers the RBA to determine the lending policy of the private banks. Now, what's really important about this is, is that we have on the record multiple times in the last 12 months or more, the Reserve Bank Governor, Michelle Bullock, lying, lying to this Australian Parliament, to the Senate, because she keeps repeatedly saying we, that is the Reserve Bank, only have one tool. That's what she says ad nauseum. We only have one tool. And this is her way of justifying the fastest interest rate increases in history. We only have one tool. We've got this inflation. We had to smash it. We only have one tool. It's not true. Part two is, there, is where they're trying to legislate away one of their other tools. It's, in the, it's actually in the law. They can, the Reserve Bank has authority over the private banks to be able to say to them, your lending is problematic. You need to fix it because you're causing problems. And so we actually, we, we constantly use this. This is, um, we, we included this graphic in the flyer so that people could see an example. And this is this is uh, from Investment Analytics Research, Dr. Wilson Sai. This is updated as of the um, close, well, middle of 2021, but the trend is the same. Though, though um, we have had all the interest rate rises since then. I'd be interested to see, you know, where those the, the last two years is. Uh, we we don't have it updated to that, but the trend is the same. But here, but what you got here is this is just bank lending in Australia divided into two main categories of 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 um, lending to business and lending to housing. And what you see in this section here in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, 
where it reached the peak of le- housing loans got to 20% of bank lending and business loans got to 70%. And since then, um, sometimes gradually, sometimes rapidly, it's inverted. And it's now pretty, almost the opposite where nearly 60% of housing of lending is to housing and a bit over 30% of lending is to business. And of course, business employs the people who pay the mortgages on the housing, right? But that is a picture of why we have some of the most expensive housing in the world because the banks just poured so much credit into it. And what section 36 of the Banking Act that they're trying to repeal in this Jim Chalmers bill says is the RBA has the power to look at a trend like that and say, this is a problem and say to the banks, rebalance your lending. And they should have done it years ago. They should have looked at this and says, say, this is a problem. Rebalance your lending we, because you're you are creating inflation in asset prices, i.e. in housing. And of course, now we have a crisis of affordable housing. And as I point out to people, if you go back to the you know 30 years ago, Martin, I know this was the period of high interest rates, et cetera. But you know what I also know? I don't remember all the discussion in 1990 about a housing shortage in Australia. So you only had 20% of bank lending going into housing. But no one was complaining of a housing shortage in Australia, right? There was no rental crisis in Australia, per se, um, like we have now. So isn't that ironic? After all this money has gone into the property market, we have a housing and rental, we have a housing shortage, a rental shortage and crisis, and the most unaffordable housing in the world. Yeah, right? and, so, yeah. And, and just on that, Robbie, um, it's very important to understand that the Bank for International Settlements imposed the risk weightings differentially between lending for housing versus lending for other purposes. Yep. And essentially was a global catalyst for pushing more and more funding and lending into the housing sector. So again, it's the technocrats, it's those international players yep. who've set an agenda, okay? Neoliberalism, market forces, let the market speak, but also tweak tweak the markets then by risk weighting housing much more advantageously to the banks. And the, because the banks said, well, our, our, our losses are a lot lower, so therefore we don't need to hold as much capital. So the banking system created the problem in the first place. And I, I always get really frustrated when people say, ah, oh, we don't have a problem, you know, the housing markets fine no the market is not a free market the housing market is not a free market no, right it's been true. manipulated specifically over the last 30 to 35 years the bis was partly responsible and then of course we also had the deregulation of the financial system under the neoliberal view of let the markets speak and you know competition is good yeah. and more competition is better so those fundamental principles have ended up messing us to where we've got to, to the point where effectively more and more bank lending is now for mortgages, which has pushed houses um, much more differentially higher relative to incomes, made it less affordable. Therefore, a smaller proportion of people actually own their properties relatively previously. More people have a mortgage into older age than they have previously. And who are the winners? The winners are the bankers because they've blown up their balance sheets, they've generated significant returns, and frankly, the whole thing's rigged. Yeah, and, and Martin, what you've identified there is quite important because that's the reason, the fact that this was a BIS directive, Bank for International Settlements Directive, is the reason that the RBA did not use this power. So now, just because they haven't used this power doesn't mean they should get rid of it. They should have yep. used it, yep. right? But instead, they default to and defer to the Bank for International Settlements apparatus, the globalised apparatus. And that's what, if they if they repeal Section 11, um, will become the permanent state of play. Yeah. Right. It's not that the it's not that the RBA will be independent. They'll just be independent of government. They will still be under this BIS apparatus. And let me make one other point because, of course, one of the argue, other arguments that was made, in fact, the RBA's made it, was well, APRA is now responsible for um, financial stability. It's not the RBA, right? But just remember that the Council of Financial Regulators is the group that sits around the table, led by the RBA with APRA with um, a few other hangers-on and the Treasury, ASIC included, right? So 
you cannot actually argue away the fact that the RBA has authority to act if it wanted to act, but it didn't want to act. And that's the critical point. Uh, exactly, exactly. So, And you can think of these parts one and two that we've talked about as a hierarchy. So part one gives the government the ultimate authority over the bank. Part two gives the government's bank the ultimate authority over the private banks. And there's a reason they want to get rid of both of them. Yep. Right? Yep. And um, uh, we'll go on. Now, so th it's very important because we come to part three now. Um, and this is the one you, you highlighted uh, a few minutes ago. I'm just going to enlarge that a bit because I want people to read this. Bear with me. I think this is worth explaining. Mm. So that at the moment, there's three objectives to the RBA Act, to the RBA. But, the, but specifically, Martin, they're objectives of RBA monetary policy, right? So um, when what, what that means is when the Reserve Bank Board sits around and makes their decision on interest rates, they have to make that decision with a mind to three objectives. First one is stability of the currency. The second one is full employment. And the third one is this beautiful phrase here, the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. Now, so they've, they've recommended some changes to this. Now, not highlighted here, but just as a bit of red meat to your um, uh, uh, to your uh, your gold and silver f fans, Martin. <laughs> One of the changes that they're going to make is they're going to change the wording from stability of the currency to price stability, and that's not quite the same thing. <laughs> and a good any 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 decent gold and silver bug will understand what I mean. That is actually not quite the same thing. Right, but that's one of the recommendations. I don't want to get bogged down in that. Do another show with someone. And see about that one. Um, uh, this bigger one though is I going to take out this this objective, the third objective. They're going to take it out from being an objective of monetary policy, and make it an overarching objective of the RBA as a bank. So it's the RBA's objective will be as a bank. It will have to be you know, have as, a, as an overarching objective, the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. But when they sit around the board to decide interest rates, they don't, they won't have to. And then their reasoning is quite, um, well, I think it gives the game away. So let me read this quote. It goes over the page here. This is why the RBA review recommended it. It is not suited to be an additional objective for monetary policy because this provides too much discretion to the RBA. Now, marry that, if you will, with the idea they want to take away any government oversight over the RBA so it runs its own show. What do you call that if not too much discretion? But anyway, so there's a contradiction there just in terms, but put that aside. But think about what this actually means. That wording, it is saying, provides too much discretion to the RBA. But too much discretion for what, Martin? It's not too much discretion to go and grow, go and grow carrots in the RBA's garden. It's not too much discretion to you know, go and legalise derivatives. It's too much discretion to benefit the people of Australia. The discretion is only in one direction. Oh, that's too much discretion. And then they have this completely ridiculous justification that the other two objectives add up to the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia anyway. If you have price stability and full employment, that equals the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. No, it does not. I, I use a very simple example here, and there's a million others, but what does full employment mean in Australia? How do we define full employment? First of all, economists define full employment and have for years as you know pretty much 5% unemployment. Um, uh, so support, pity the 5% who aren't included in the real world, right? They're not, they don't count. Second of all, you work a month, uh, you work an hour a month in Australia, you're officially employed. That does not equal prosperity, but it equals employment, right? I mean, this, 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 the, 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 these things do not add up that to economic prosperity. So when the RBA has to make its decisions now, now I would argue they've been, they haven't been good at following this um, objective, but that doesn't mean we should get rid of it. That means that's the reason why people 
parties like ours existed. That's the reason why the Greens have been making an issue out of this. This has reached crisis points in Australia, and we're the ones that are saying, hang on, it's in your own legislation. Do your job. You are not, and whatever the RBA achieved with reigning in inflation over the last two years does not equal the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. They've smashed the people of Australia to achieve this, this um, uh, to, 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 to claim they've reduced inflation, right? They've absolutely smashed them. There's a reason these people put this in, the people who legislated this put this in, and it, it would be a terrible thing if they got rid of it. Um. And I think, you know, we were able to make some pretty significant, these points, uh, we got through to quite a few people. Uh, there's only, there's probably about a month to go before they vote on this. And, and hope we'll, we'll keep hammering these these points two and three now that we're confident, more confident in point one, part one, um, because they are, I hope the view, viewer can, you know, understand now that we've laid it out. They actually are incredibly significant. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I've got a perspective here, which um, um, I want to use an analogy. You know, we, we just watched uh, recently um, a moon lander, you know, from Earth to the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sort of were controlling it, but they were, you know, they had lots of issues and it ultimately didn't quite land how they'd wanted it to land, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the RBA has this same philosophy about the economy, right? So they're sort of twiddling the dials. And they're, what they're trying to do is to actually, you know, keep within this 2 to 3% band, and that's all that we're worrying about, and they're looking at the dials. But they're not actually thinking about the, hang on, where am I in space? And, you know, is it, is it creating the right or the wrong outcomes? And, and actually, if you think about full employment, right, what it basically says is work till you drop. <laughs> that's what they're yeah. on about, right? So, <laughs> so again, what we have is, is this concept of, of, of free market driving a particular set of outcomes, but they're only twiddling a couple of dials. And just like the um, problem with the lander on the moon when it actually um, hit a bit hard and then broke some legs and didn't really work, although they're claiming victory retrospectively even now, I notice. Um, and at some level it was a victory, but it wasn't a complete success. I think the RBA is in the same boat, right? So basically they've got this myopic narrow view of how they're actually controlling the economy. And it's like they're almost masters of the universe. You know, they're playing this sort of, you know, this game where they're twiddling the knobs. In the real world, in the real world, we've got a lot of people who are very much up against it at the moment and the economy isn't working for them. And, and I think maybe finally the politicians are beginning to wake up to the fact that there's actually a broader narrative that needs to be explored. Now, fingers crossed, hopefully that'll be the case. But I'm astonished that Labour is the one driving this change in. And, and you know, I'm so grateful to those who actually reached out to their politicians and sent emails and phoned them up and made a fuss because that has helped to raise this issue up and we'll get a better outcome as a result. Well, let's talk about that now, but let's start. Sorry, I was just bumped that. Let's start with, um, uh, we'll just insert the uh, the question that on uh, Tuesday, um, uh, Max, the Greens MP, Max Chandler Mather, who, this young guy in the parliament who, I mean, I don't, I don't know him, but I, I love the way he, 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 more than anyone, he gets up Albanese's nose. <laughs> Uh, and I, I've got. To, I, I told someone this comparison. I because I, Albanese is supposedly he, like he's known as a almost a warrior of the mm. left, right? Yeah. Now, whatever your view on politics is, you want people to be true to themselves, right? So you, you know you may not like the left, but the left what it what the left traditionally was are the people who are genuinely dedicated to improving the lot of the working class. That's what you know. There's a whole bunch of cultural stuff and whatever, and I won't get into that. But what it originally, you know, what it originally was was that, and that's what Labor likes to claim that that they are. Um, uh, and Albo was was a guy who was who was seen as that. Max Chandler Mather, since he's been in Parliament, he's the guy who's been hammering about public housing and those kind of issues. And and Albo gets so angry. And so the, what it reminds me of there's a the great the 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 movie the John Grisham movie The Rainmaker. Um, where Matt Damon plays the young lawyer, and there's a scene where he sits down with John Voight's character, who's the old rich, older rich lawyer, and 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 Matt Damon says to him, "Do you ever, do you even remember when you first sold out? <laughs> Why are you little whippersnap? You know, um, and and because sorry, elbow, whatever. 
I don't know what happened, but he sold out. And this, what we're about to play, demonstrates that. This is as neoliberal an answer as you will ever see given in the parliament by the man who cried in 2011 saying, I just want to fight Tories. Sorry, Albo, you are the Tory. Roll the tape. And I give the call to the member for Griffith. Question to the Prime Minister. Since the Reserve Bank review, the Greens have opposed the government's proposal to remove its power to protect renters and mortgage holders from unreasonable interest rate rises. Former Prime Minister Keating and two former RBA governors have publicly agreed with us that big political decisions like interest rate rises require political accountability. Will, admit, will you admit your government was wrong to try and give up its power to overall unreasonable interest rate increases and back the Greens' change to the bill? Order. Order. Prime Minister has the call. What's surprising here isn't that the Greens political party have that position. It's that the Liberal Party, or well. some of them, are saying that they'll back you on that as well. We'll see what happens in the Senate. But we had an RBA review, and the government's response is all about reinforcing the independence of the Reserve Bank. The independence of the Reserve Bank to deal... Order the member for Hume to deal with monetary policy and the government's responsibility through the budget to deal with fiscal policy. And we won't want them, of course, to work together, which is what uh, we have been doing, which is why we produced the first budget surplus in 15 years. Now, Senator Order. McKim has shown through he sniping from the sidelines that he knows nothing about how the RBA functions and he doesn't understand the review. And he has found a kindred spirit in the Shadow Treasurer. The Shadow Treasurer uh, was consulted Order. by the Treasurer for more than a year. And he has never mentioned once, once, any proposal to override power as a concern. Uh, this only shows that it's all about political posturing and opportunism and not considered... The member for Hume is going to cease interjecting for the remainder of this answer or to be warned. Not a considered view about the policy. Uh, what is clear is that the Shadow Treasurer not only cannot get a question to the Treasurer in question time, he has no authority amongst his colleagues who are trying to go down a populist route. Now, uh, the Treasurer has done his best uh, to be... Bipartisan, the member for reasonable. Groom will cease interjecting. The light shines upon the member for Groom, Mr. Speaker, but it doesn't make him any brighter. <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker. Order. Order. Mr. Just Speaker. Order. Members on my left. Just going to ask. Just, just going to ask the prime minister. Just the member for Barker. I'm just going to ask the, pr the Prime Minister to withdraw that comment. I, I withdraw, Mr Speaker. To assist the House. Um, Order. Uh, Senator Hume has said this, which I, is beyond my comprehension. Uh, in, fact, Order. in fact, it keeps the RBA Order. more independent if the government can override them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the position of their Shadow Minister in the other place. They want to side with the Greens. You can wear it. You can wear it because we expect economic irresponsibility from them, but we expect a little bit better from mainstream political parties. Yeah, absolutely astonishing. And uh, you know, I've said for some time that the main problem we have in Australia is that the two major parties have tended to be on the same side of politics. It almost doesn't matter whether you are actually, um, you know, one side or the other side. But from a heritage perspective. But that answer just shows that he's a turncoat. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. And this is, you know, we, we're quoting his predecessor, Labor Prime Minister predecessor, John Curtin, and he is trashing that whole legacy, trashing it. And then what he so, but what he's really angry at is we, Martin, we have got the coalition, which he calls the other responsible party, <laughs> right? We have got the coalition on the run. 
and and that is not because the coalition has you know necessarily has principles here individuals do but that's and this is what i wanted to explain to people so this is how this victory is is shaping up how it came about when this was first handed down um there was immediate opposition the greens were opposed straight away and the greens um it's really sad but the the uh they had a really good advisor who died later last year but he was he was still uh there in parliament with them um when this review was handed down and uh he helped you know lead the lead the the greens to say no we're going to oppose this so the greens declared their opposition from the beginning we declared our opposition from the beginning and you had some others um including um uh senator malcolm roberts from one nation and a couple of liberals like senator jared rennie said no this is we're not gonna i'm, I'm not gonna support getting rid of section 11 right we the citizens party we've made a video called the great betrayal and actually gave the history that we've elaborated in an elaborated way that is in this um flyer that we've got here so the greens the greens were opposed we were opposed and and uh uh one nation now um the first thing that we've achieved was the was the inquiry, and that was achieved last November. So when they introduced the bill last, when Jim Chalmers introduced the bill, it went to a Senate inquiry. Now that's usually a matter of course, but it wasn't supposed to because a week after the inquiry started, Jim Chalmers complained and he and he accused um, Angus Taylor of reneging on their agreement because this is the most important thing. When the review was first handed down. Angus Taylor, the shadow treasurer for the Liberals, was gushing over it. He offered full support for this review. In fact, he's in Jim Chalmers' speech introducing the bill, he cited the bipartisanship on this issue. The reason the coalition decided they better support an inquiry is because of us, because of the phone calls and the emails they started being bombarded with from April last year, Right, and it built up, and it built up, and it built up, and they thought at a minimum it's got to go to an inquiry. We will not commit to this. We'll send it to an inquiry. Um, now, and and not to, like the, the Greens have have done a very important job, but they didn't do the Greens don't shift the coalition. I can I can tell you, like they 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 do what they do, but they don't shift the coalition. That is us. We shifted the coalition to say we need to have an inquiry, and then once we got the inquiry, that's done most of the work. Because it, it, we'll probably only have one hearing, but that one hearing was so devastating. What it showed those Labor, sorry, those Liberals and, and Nationals who had supported inquiry, they thought, huh, well, we've been trying to scratch our head for the last few months saying, how are we going to justify not doing what the bankers want? Because we're worried about what the people are going to do to us that, we, that are bombarding us with calls. Suddenly, they've got um, some uh, reinforcements from some of the biggest heavy hitters in Australia's recent economic management history, Peter Costello, Ian McFarlane, Bernie Fraser, and now they feel much more confident after hearing their testimony. Oh well, that, that's it. We're, this is consolidated to our position. Um, and in the meetings we had, this was pretty much confirmed to us. And in fact, the, 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 this one particular um, member of Parliament who was quite vocal inside the party room and not not one of the usual suspects that you might um expect to to be vocal this was this was the first time I've actually had a meeting in this person's office I can't I can't say the name um when he met with us uh he was really enthusiastic and he said he said I'm fighting the good fight you should know I'm fighting the good fight <laughs> And here's what he did that he considered revolutionary and it had a big impact on the party room. You know what he did? He went back to Hansard in 1959 and read what the minister in 1959, Spooner, the treasurer in 1959, Mr. Spooner, said in the speech about Section 11, why they were putting it in, the, keeping it in the bill. And he, that was a liberal government, the Menzies government, right? And he thought, well, this is relevant to tell the party room. <laughs> I'm thinking, hallelujah. Finally, someone goes bothers to go find out where, why something was put in there rather than just having these stupid knee-jerk reactions to getting rid of it. And and um, he pretty much confirmed to me that, at least from the standpoint of Section 11, Part 1, that is um, uh, that they're, 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 it's, it's pretty much defeated. 
And but they haven't done much on parts two and part three yet. But that's where we're at now. Like I said, we won't crow about it until the final vote. And that's probably more than a month away. If it gets there, Jim Chalmers may pull the bill, actually. Um, this was one of the reviews, one of the recommendations, Martin, of the RBA review was that these changes must be bipartisan because if they're not, do not push it. Try and achieve things like better independence other ways. So there is a chance Jim Chalmers might even pull the bill and it won't go to a vote, in which case that's an outright victory. Um, but if it goes to a vote, we're pretty confident that it won't pass, at least with um, part one as is. That will be amended out. and Hopefully by then we can have parts two and part three amended out as well. And if we achieve that, it's because we shifted the coalition and, we, and that shift in the coalition came about from this show, our show, and the, the viewers like you who pick up the phone, send the email, you do make a difference. And in this case, you've saved one of the most important and almost unique legacies. In fact, this has been a, a part of the discussion around Section 11. Everyone has talked about not many countries have this, and it's a great legacy of a great man. This is one. This is the man who saved Australia in World War II, John Curtin, right? He saved us in World War II, and at the end of World War II, his priority was was to pass the Commonwealth Bank Act with Section 11 in it. Um, and of course, Ben Chifley as well. And we've that's that's a unique feature of Australian of the Australian landscape. We um, are well on the way to saving it. Absolutely. And it's just interesting, isn't it? When you reflect on this, the other thing that I would say is that it proves to me that actually politicians do have brains. And if they choose to use them right. rather than actually just follow the herd or follow the, the whips or, yep. or, or whatever, you can get very important things happening. And, and this tells me something about the nature of the way that politics works around the world, but also in Australia specifically. And you know, I'm I'm quite open to the idea that there are people in the parliamentary system with brains sufficiently big to be able to actually understand what they're doing. And my question then is, why don't they do it more often? <laughs> well, I think I think we have um, helped to bring about. We're bringing about a revolution in mo very modern Australian politics, and the revolution is taking the form of bringing the the voice of the people back into this, not not just a vote in the form of a vote every three years, but engaging in the process. And it seems boring because, every you know, how many times have you and I now, Martin, announced the Senate inquiry? I know. But they're getting more exciting. Yes. Right? We haven't even talked about the bank closures one tonight. We don't have time. And that's getting – that's exciting too. Um, they, they, they These things are getting quite exciting and then you see how – if, see, if we weren't there in the form of representing the engagement of massive numbers of the public, then all the politicians to, are getting, as bright as they are, as they may be, and forget, uh, look, as an aside, I'll come back to this, as an aside, you know, everyone told me that Albanese's joke was funny about the member for Groom in that clip. Well, it may be funny, but I'll t this is my view of it. That's the, the, I was there in the room. I was in the gallery when he, made, when he was answering this question. All he had is that kind of theatrics. Yep. All his, all the politicians behind him have is this street theatre that they call politics, right? And they cling to that because there's no actual other substance. There isn't any. It is totally depressing. What with you know, you always hope, you always hope for the best with a new government, and especially someone like Albanese, what he's what he's um shown himself to be, and so. Yeah, he came up through the ranks of student politics because he's a he's a career politician, right? He came up through those ranks and you know the 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 knuckle duster, bare knuckle fighting, etc. And they think that's great. It ain't a substitute for substance. And he had no substance in his answer except to cry that the coalition had abandoned the rule that the responsible parties have to do what the bankers say, which is essentially what he was crying about. Um, you know. The but the 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 politicians who are bright, if they have more engagement from the public, that's what will motivate them to to do the right thing. And in this case, and I, the guy who said he's fighting the good fight, he was responding to the public um, uh, outreach, right? 
and it motivated him to, to do some work and he was amazed by the result. And, and might I say, it doesn't hurt that um, a whole bunch of these guys are looking ahead a year to the fact they have to get re-elected again. And when you're in opposition, you want to give the, you know, you want to be seen to be responding to the people. It's actually, it was a really good timing for us. Um, maybe we might not have achieved this in this in this way if, if this was done in 2022, right? When when the government was newer and more arrogant, but this is really a good timing for us, especially from the standpoint of the coalition. So look, if you participate in this back, pat yourself on the back. If you're someone who's a regular viewer of, of Martin's shows and and um and, you know discussions with me, etc., and you have you've yet you've yet to find the motivation to actually do it, and you think, oh, you know, look, it's working. Right, and you should add, and don't think, oh well, they don't need me. No, no, we do need you. Make sure that next time you make the call, you send the email. You, the things that we've identified are worth engaging in. Engage because we um, can have these uh, successes. And yes, I haven't declared total victory yet, but we're well on the way. Yeah, and uh, just to underscore, social media can be harnessed and used for positive outcomes, as as we've shown. You know, the commission. 100%. The commission and inquiry into uh, the you know the bank closures, this and of course the cash ban and other things too, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of continued drive to make it happen. But the point is that politicians are now alive to the fact that we actually <laughs> there is a community, and the community yeah, yeah, can yeah. have very strong opinions and very important opinions about what's going on. So uh, you know this is uh, very important. Kudos to you, Robbie, as well in terms of all the stuff that you and your your, your organisation is is running with as well. Um, you know, and the other point I'd make is this is this is multiple parties all pushing in a similar direction oh, yeah. to get an outcome. But it is down to those individual voices and those individuals who actually took the time and the effort to send emails and uh, make phone calls and all those things because this is actually democracy. In action, yep. And look, it is a team effort, and we've sh we share this this result with the other parties that engage. Why I want to emphasise the shifting of the Liberals is I know that that part is not the Greens, etc. As they've done their job in a really good way, and I really ta I really admire their stance on this and how what they've done, and they've led the fight inside the Parliament. But they don't shift the coalition. It's the people in the in the community that do, and that's something. You know, I'm absolutely convinced you can identify, hang on, that's what we did, right? And when you know that, you feel more, more and you can identify what you, the, the, the results you've had, um, uh, you, you need to feel more empowered and more resolved to do more. Absolutely, Robert. Well, thank you very much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll get this show out. Uh, thanks, and we, Martin. And, and we should and we should catch up down the track on the um, the uh, yeah, well, branch situation because that. Things. Yeah, yeah. There's a few other things bubbling along, but uh, let's uh, focus on this tonight. Thank you very much, yeah. and uh, we'll thanks, keep Martin. we'll keep battling. Thanks, Martin. See ya. See ya.